Welcome to the Joy Powered Workspace podcast, where we talk about embracing joy in the workplace. I'm Susan White, owner of Susan Tinder White Consulting, and with me is my co-host and good friend, Jody Curtis, owner of Purple Inc., an HR consulting firm. If we sound any different to you today, we are still in a shelter in place in central Indiana where both Jody and I live, and so we're recording remotely. Our topic today is pre-employment assessments. HireVue issued a white paper in February 2019 entitled The Next Generation of Assessments that was written by three different people, Dr. Nathan Mondragon, Clemens Eichholzer, and Dr. Kiki Lautner. Jody, I found this paper so interesting because it gave us kind of a historical background on when assessments started, what's happening in the landscape today. So I'd love to share a few of those insights. Yeah. First thing they said was, that the whole concept of bringing assessments into the hiring process really became popular in the 1970s. I found that fascinating because that was before even I was in HR. <laughs> so I thought, they were, I thought they were around for a very long time, but really in the 1970s, that's not that long ago. It was within the, la- within the last 50 years. And when they came in, what became very important, and I think all of us in the HR profession now really hang on to, is making sure that if you're going to do an assessment, that it's valid. And of course, the definition for validity as it relates to an assessment is that whatever instrument you're using, it consistently measures what it is intended to do. Or as these authors said, that the assessments are designed around specific jobs and job-related competencies. Yeah, I think that's really important for us to make sure for everything else we talk about on this podcast, or people get excited sometimes about, ooh, I want to try this assessment or that assessment is to make sure is validated for their own organization and for the, the positions that they're hiring for. What an assessment mm-hmm. tool that might be good for one company might not be, even, even though the assessment itself might be validated, is it measuring what your company needs it to measure? Absolutely. Yeah. So- most assessments, when they first came out in the 1970s, were done on site, of course, at employers. They were usually written multiple choice questions. And then in the 1980s, people started getting, going through assessments. Employers started offering them via automated phone recordings. I can remember that in, in the you bank. Because I was going to say, yes. I ever recall that. I do. <laughs> I that stage. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're younger than me. That could be. So, yes, you would actually call an automated number. They would ask phone number, and you'd be asked these questions by a machine, and you would leave your answers. So I thought that was interesting. In the 1990s, employers started using computers, as we did in all aspects of our job. They started using them for assessments, and then eventually started putting these uh, assessments over the Internet so that people could do them in the privacy of their homes. By 2010, we started to see more things happening on the assessment front, things started to change from just responding to static multiple choice types of questions to detecting if the individual has job-related competencies to perform the job through other means. And I think we're going to learn more about that today. Yeah. Even that timeline was interesting to me, Susan, because in, although I had used some assessments maybe in the late 90s, Really, for the first time, I started using Predictive Index in 2003, and at that time, I, we were still giving it on a piece of paper that people sure. filled out when they came into the office. So even, you know, if we didn't go to a computerized version of that, gosh, I don't know, till late 2000s, you know, maybe 2009, 2010, so... Yeah, no, that's very, yeah. I think it all depends on where you were company-wise and your level right. of technology available. And now that it's become so easy via the internet, we're going to have a, a guest later today that I think is really going to help us understand all the things that are, that are at our fingertips if we're employers trying to figure out how to use assessments. Yes, yes. So in this paper uh, that these three people wrote that I thought was so helpful, They explained that they believed that to ensure job success, individuals need to be evaluated not only on job-related competencies, but they also think on cognitive ability, emotional intelligence, and personalities that are a fit. We hear so much about that, fit for the role and for the company that they're joining. So you'd think it would would take a ton of time, right, to to test them on all those components, which you think, oh, this is not a great candidate experience. This could be costly, take a lot of money. 
which when reality over the last few year, years, especially with the introduction of artificial intelligence into assessments, you can be actually administering one or two assessments that's going to actually give you feedback on multitude of these factors. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty exciting. Technology is yeah. really coming to um, help move along the whole concept of assessments. Right. And I do think that's another really important thing for our listeners to be aware of. I personally am a fan of assessments. But it has to be a balance between getting the best information for the organization with also creating a positive user experience for the candidates. So you have to consider you can't, you know, have people spending a lot of time on assessments if they're frustrated by that or if it takes them too long. And if your competition is not doing that, you know, just balancing the two. I think that's fair. I know in past episodes, we've talked about Hire View and Spark Hire and all of those other video interviewing technology platforms that not only can you, you know, have the opportunity to interview a lot of different people, but they're using AI in those video interviews to try to detect how the person, the words that they choose to use, the facial expressions that they have, the tone, all of that feeds into figuring out is the person they're assessing if they're a job fit, their company fit, if they have the cognitive abilities, the EQ. And when we talked about it before, Jody, you had had experience with Spark Hire. Tell us, our listeners, if they didn't catch that episode, what your belief was around that. Yes. So again, I think Spark Hire can be a very powerful tool of doing videos and, and there's a good balance of then other part, you know, if, a, if one of your recruiters, for example, is doing the interview, and then you can show that interview to hiring managers where they can sit at their own time and be able to watch those. So that can be a very efficient process to do that. At the same time, we found some people very uncomfortable with the process of having a video interview. And people were struggling to not the, the software itself, I thought was very simple, but people maybe could record themselves. And if you gave them multiple attempts to record, they would get a little obsessive about making sure <laughs> it was perfect. And so Aww. they would find that experience frustrating for them. I, in one of my SHRM classes, we talked about Spark Hire as well. And, and one of my participants one time said they had found huge success with Spark Hire with college students or people just out of college because they were much more comfortable on video. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a good process too, to think about what kind of candidate or what kind of experience were you wanting to promote or encourage? And is that the type of candidate you wanted? You know, if you work in a high tech environment, then maybe you need people to be comfortable with that process. Certainly in light of the pandemic and our stay at home rules, people are getting more comfortable on Zoom meetings and being on camera or Absolutely. they are. So that, you know, that trend might change now. Yeah, no, very true. I'm so intrigued with the fact that how you speak and what you do, you know, with your facial expressions and things like that while you're interviewing is actually telling the assessor things about you that you don't even mean. I, I don't yeah. even know. I find that yeah. whole thing fascinating. Uh, yep. Another type of um, assessments that's just really gaining in popularity are the game-based assessments yeah. becoming mm -hmm. increasingly popular. You know, how long it takes you as you think through a question could actually, with AI's help, determine qualities about yourself you don't realize. But yep. the person who's doing the game-based assessment, hopefully they're having some fun because it's right. an interesting type of uh, exercise as right. opposed to multiple choice paper and pen question that we used to ask people. Most of those game-based assessments take about six to 15 minutes to complete. So it's not, you know, horrendous. It's not like actually going in and, and having a full interview. Most of them include a progressive game-based approach that's tailored to each applicant, meaning that depending on when you, how long it takes you to complete a task, how you complete that task, uh, a door opens for the next task that could be more difficult or to take you down a particular line. So the actual next, you could be sitting next to somebody who's actually taking the same initial uh, game-based assessment and the actual tasks that they complete could be very, very different depending yeah. on how they actually complete each and every task. 
every swipe, every selection, every pause is analyzed and helps the employer know if the person's a fit or not. I find yeah. it fascinating. It is fascinating. I think things like that too are really important to, or can be really important to set the tone again for your organization. Do you want to be viewed by applicants as someone who's very progressive and very technology oriented? And if that's the type of candidate that you are seeking, that can be a very positive experience and, and set a very positive tone for that process. Mm -hmm. Sure, that makes sense. Now a word from our sponsors. Do you want more audio content that helps you find joy at work? The third joy-powered book, The Joy-Powered Team, is now available as an audio book. The Joy-Powered Team helps business leaders and associates build strong, inclusive teams, navigate workplace challenges, revitalize teams who falter, and thrive as teams evolve. You can find The Joy-Powered Team in print, ebook and audiobook on Amazon or on our website at getjoypowered.com slash books. Well, Jody, I, we did ask an expert to come in today. It's Phil Devendorf. Phil is president of PD Services, which is a 25-year-old company that provides job fit assessments, entry-level hiring assessments, and 360 feedback surveys for developing managers and really talent management systems throughout your organization. PD Services is based in Ohio and works with companies across the nation. Welcome, Phil. We're so happy to have you here today. Do you mind sharing with us how you got into the assessment business? What drew you to it? Well, sure. So I had, uh, I started my career in line management and line executive positions in the IT industry. And, and there I was an assessment user. I found great value in the assessment data, both in hiring folks as well as managing my existing staff. And so 25 years ago or so, I started PD Services. And we did at that time a lot of management training and coaching and consulting. And I wanted to have that same data on my clients as I began training or coaching managers. And so I, I enlisted a partnership of, uh, of an assessment company to do that. And, and initially, it was primarily with my existing client base. But it, at one point in time, I was reviewing a particularly challenging coaching engagement with a, with a manager. And the owner of the company made the comment, I wish I would have known this before I hired him. And, and that was the light that came on that said, yeah, there's a lot of value in this information in the hiring process. Yeah, nice. Well, and Phil, don't you think a lot of hiring managers are taught or definitely encouraged to trust their instincts? So why might not that not be such a great idea <laughs> when making hiring decisions? Well, that, that's an interesting question. And, and we talk about that a lot. There's a lot of research out there that's available. I'm a data guy, and so I, I look at a lot of research it, that, that tells us that that's not a bad idea. And the reason, or that that is a bad idea, I should say, <laughs> the, the, the reason is that most of us traditionally in the hiring process have, have relied on information from resumes and job applications and interviews. And the, the fact is, that, that information is going to be biased toward the candidate because the candidate's the one giving us that. And also, there just isn't enough good objective information to make a good management decision, hiring decision, if you will. And, and the research shows that we have about a 25% success rate using that information because it leads to, to kind of a gut feel or, a, or an instinctual hiring decision. If we can add good objective data, of course, from, a, from assessment testing, that success rate increases astronomically. We, we see success rates getting up into the 75% range. Um, wow, that's a huge difference. The other thing that different. we need to take into account is instinctive hiring or gut feel hiring incorporates a lot of bias. 
-hmm. And if we're trying to get bias out of the hiring process, good objective information is the way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny, Phil, I probably in my life, I can't even tell you how many people I've interviewed. I'm going to say thousands, but I don't think I'm wrong, but I, I just unbelievable amount. And I think I learned early on that there was times I just knew somebody would be great. I just knew it and they'd show up and I'm like, where's the person I interviewed? <laughs> this is yeah. not the right person. <laughs> so I, I think that you're right. We've got to have objective data. We've got to have really thoughtful interviewing processes. And I love the thought of introducing assessments if, if people aren't already using them. So it's, let's just it's, assume. It's interesting yeah. on that point is that the, the reverse can be true as well. Some people interview very well and, and they, they put their best foot forward. And those are the people that surprise you when they show up. Yes. But the, the thing that's sometimes unexpected is there are people who just don't really impress you in the mm. interview process. Yes. And if we get that objective data on them, you may find they're your best employee. I or love that. Or you have passed on them in the process. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes good sense. So let's just say I feel like I've got a good interviewing process, but I want to add assessments because I want to get to that 70% success rate or more. Where does a company start? Like, where do you recommend when a client comes to you and says, I think I'm interested, where do I go first? Yeah, well, of course, I think they should start by talking with me. <laughs> of course. But, but, um, <laughs> but, but, but really, it, it does help to get advice from, from somebody who's been involved. I've seen there's an insurance company that says kind of, I've seen it all in, in their ads. And I, I, I kind of feel that way, but I certainly biased myself toward my products. But, but the fact is that as an independent distributor, I've evaluated lots of assessments and I've changed over the years to, to use what I feel are the best assessments in the, on the marketplace. So, so that's one piece of it. The other thing is, I, I can also point you to a lot of objective resources from places like SHRM, the Department of Labor, other third-party articles and those kind of things, which can kind of lay out what is it that you need to pay attention to if you're going to incorporate assessments. It's, for, for a lot of people, it sounds very scary to, to incorporate it. It's really not that difficult. But, you know, there are certain things that you need to pay attention to. I suggest people start by defining the problem that needs to be solved or, or the value that they want to receive. You know, get a clear picture of what they're trying to accomplish. Are they trying to lower turnover by X percent? Are they trying to uh, increase new hire productivity? Are they trying to increase customer satisfaction? Or maybe it's salespeople. They want to increase the revenue per salesperson. And, and once there's a clear picture, then they can do things like assess what is the cost of our turnover or what is the return on investment for this project. Mm -hmm. And then we can fit the assessment to, to the specific need. Now, the, the other piece that's important there is to define the benchmark, if you will, the, the pattern that you're hiring toward. We work with our clients to, to define what are the characteristics? What's the cognitive ability that this job needs? What level of cognitive or reasoning ability? What are the behavioral traits that are really going to make someone perform in this job? And so that's a big piece of the upfront work. We have a lot of research that can help you through this. It's not very hard at all. You can kind of take off the shelf benchmarks or we can uh, customize them for you. And then I would take that and try it out, you know, do a little trial, do a pilot on a specific position that may be a problem position or what have you. So, yeah. Phil, uh, you know, I can think of times in my history where we had, you know, excruciating turnover on the front line. And we looked at assessments that we could do so that we could hopefully, you know, reduce turnover. Good example. When you do, when you figure out, okay, so there's maybe off the shelf product out there that has been used by, you know, hundreds of companies. Do you have to at your own firm run it through a pilot for a period, a long period of time to demonstrate that it's reliable and valid for your position? Or are, is there some threshold that if it's been approved and out there for a long period of time that you really you do your pilot just to make sure that you think it fits in your company, but you're not having to prove validity and 
reliability all over again? Good question. And there's the, the answer is going to be a little bit of both. Okay. First of all, the vendor, the assessment vendor, should provide assessment validation, validity and reliability data. There should be a technical manual that shows that, that they have done the work to prove that it's valid and reliable. Okay. Pay attention to this when you're selecting a vendor because over my 25 years in doing this, it's very disappointing to see how many assessment vendors don't do the basic groundwork of validating the assessment or their validation numbers really aren't very good. And a lot of those are very popular assessments in the market. So, so that's kind of the, the first step in evaluating a vendor is that assessment work should be done properly. Mm. Now, there's a, a second term called local validity. And that is, does the assessment really apply to the job and predict performance in the job? And, and that's where that benchmark comes in. If, if you've done a, a, a benchmark for the job, that's local validity. Mm. Does that make sense? It does, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Bill, I mentioned that at the top of the podcast that an assessment could be valid. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best one for your organization or for a particular type of position, right? I mean, that's why you offer several different assessments. Right. So what are some of the most common assessments you see companies using today? Well, we see, and, and there's, there are a ton of assessments out there in the marketplace, and also the term assessment gets used very widely for a variety of things. So, so if we limit our discussion to job fit assessments or personality assessments or those types of things, then I see an awful lot of what, what I call employee-only assessments. You, you'll see uh, DISC and Myers-Briggs and, and those types of assessments, which are often with the DISC, there are a variety of DISC tools out there, but, but all of them are four-quadrant tools where a, a person will select what's most like me, maybe least like me from a, a list of descriptors, and it'll give us a four quadrant tool. Those are great for team exercises, communication exercises, maybe some development tools, some of those kind of things, but they measure adapted personality, how people have adjusted in a given environment. And so it's not good information in the hiring process. Mm -hmm. You wanna know what their core behaviors are. Yeah. And so you want to make sure you're using an assessment that measures core behavior and cognitive and those kind of things to fit with the job because people are going to adapt differently. But yeah. again, the DISC and Myers-Briggs are good in the environment of with existing employees who are already in your organization because their adaptive personality makes sense. You, you want to see that. There has been a huge growth over the past geez, I don't know, 10 or 15 years in hiring assessments. And, and there are a number, you know, unfortunately for me, there are a number of competitors out there that, that do measure core behavior. They measure cognitive. They, they focus on job fit and those kind of things. So we see that a lot. Beyond that, we see a lot of skills testing for specific jobs. And, and then you hear assessment used, even when we're talking about uh, applicant tracking systems and doing some initial just basic questions for screening mm. individuals out. A lot of those vendors, the ETS vendors talk about assessments, but it's really nothing more than specific questions that are, that are asked, screening questions that are asked. Sure. So what, when you use the term job fit, define that for us when, you're, when it relates to assessments. Like what are some of the things that you could do with assessments to figure out job fit? Sure. I, I've used the term benchmark and um, patterns, job patterns, success patterns. The, the industry has a number of terms for it, but it's basically building a benchmark of what are the characteristics which are going to lead to high performance in a given job. So different jobs need different levels of cognitive, or, or, or I use the term reasoning ability for the same thing. 
And uh, so we wanted to find that. Let, let's take a sales job for a, a complex product. If it's a complex decision process where a number of people are involved in a decision, then they need to have the ability to take in a lot of information about the requirements, about where different people are coming from, all those kind of things. It's an information intensive process. They need to be high in reasoning ability. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's a sales position for a commodity, let's say it's retail or, or kind of an order taking type position, high reasoning ability isn't required. And, and in fact, it can be a detriment because they're gonna get bored in that position and, and leave. So we want to define where they fit. Then if you get into personality characteristics, let's, let's take a job that needs a high level of optimism and trust. You need to be up, upbeat, those kind of things. But some other jobs require a good bit of skepticism that's really on the other end of that, of that scale. So we want to define where a high-performing person is in that behavioral characteristic. The same might be true of people orientation, that extroversion and introversion things. Sure. If it's a customer service job with a high level of person-to-person -person contact, you want someone high in that people orientation scale. But if it's a programmer that needs to go off and work on their own for extended periods of time, you, you want them to be lower on that scale because they'll struggle if they don't have the people contact. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it strikes me, Jody, as we're listening to this, that I think we need an assessment for how joy-powered someone is. <laughs> <laughs> we can work on that. We yeah. can create that. So, yeah. Well, Bill, can you share some examples with us of some business success stories after a company started using assessments in their hiring process? Sure. One of my longtime clients is is in the senior housing industry and uh, so they've been a client for at least 15 years maybe 20 years and uh, one of the things that, that they do with me a lot is they tease me a good bit that I'm working myself out of a job because <laughs> over time for given positions they keep using fewer and fewer assessments because they're doing less and less hiring mm -hmm. tying back to lower turnover now, the good news there is they, they continue to expand the use of assessments to different jobs and different divisions and some of those kind of things. So my revenue isn't really going down, but, uh, but they <laughs> kid me a good bit that, that my business model is terrible because if I do a good job, I lose business. Yeah. Oh, but that is success. Um, do you have any examples where maybe a company ran into trouble because they were not using the right assessments or maybe not using them effectively? I haven't had a lot of that. I'll, I'll give you an example that happened a few years ago. And it was a company with that, that was a unionized company and they, they had a very structured hiring process and they were challenged. And I forget if it was the Department of Labor or who came in, but a, uh, a complaint had been lodged by a, uh, uh, a woman over... 50 or whatever it was, she, she, the, the complaint was that everyone who was invited to the final interview was a, was a young male. And so the, the agency came in with that complaint and asked for all the data. I got a call from the client saying, can you, can you forward the uh, validity and reliability information? Because I need to, to provide that to the, uh, uh, let's say it was a Department of Labor. And, um, and she called me shortly thereafter and said, we're done. She said, I've never seen anything that has, uh, that has come to conclusion so quickly because they, they took the assessment data that we had. It showed clearly that the people we selected had stronger assessment results than the people we didn't, including the plaintiff. And... They looked at the reliability and validity data and said, yep, you're using a good assessment and it clearly shows objectively why you chose to bring these people in. So you're fine. Nice. Nice. Very good. One thing that's always puzzled me about assessments is the reasoning ability. When you're trying to measure reasoning ability, can you kind of share with us what types of questions or how do you go about measuring reasoning? Good question. It's, um, 
it's largely a series of, think of them as story problems from school, if you will, mm-hmm. where the, the, the assessment will present data, present a situation, and ask the uh, assessment taker to kind of reason through what has been presented and come to a conclusion and select the right answer based on that. So we will we'll incorporate number-oriented problems and, and word-oriented problems. And then we also, our assessment, and this is one of the things that, that I really like about it, also includes shape sequences, the types of things where you'll see three kind of boxes of shapes that are slightly different, and you've got to mentally figure out what the pattern of the change is, and then select from a, a, a list of four or five what the next pattern would be. And that measures conceptual thinking skills, almost like three-dimensional thinking skills. Mm, I think um, I'd be doomed, Phil. I think I, 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 <laughs> you, you know, it's some people love those. They have fun with them, and, and other people despise them. Yes. <laughs> um, I was just, I'm glad to hear Susan say she might be doomed because I do not like those types of assessments. <laughs> I think but, I'm not but, a successful person on that in reasoning. Yeah, and, and you might be, you might be surprised at how well you do. With both of you, I suspect that you have conceptual thinking skills to have accomplished what you have. So oh, thank well, you, Phil. Thank you. Surprised. <laughs> Phil, I want to go back to your comment earlier where you mentioned about DISC and, and Myers-Briggs. You know, at, at Purple Inc., we are huge fans also of Clifton Strengths, which is also not a valid hiring assessment tool and should never be used as a part of the decision making for hiring people. But I do hear, I do ha- have a lot of clients still who are using DISC and and some that use Myers-Briggs and tell me that, well, even if it's not validated for hiring, they like, it's it's additional information they can use in the process. But I just always recommend that they, you know, not use it, for example, in Clifton Strengths, like they should never say, I'm going to hire a salesperson and they have to have these three strengths. What do you tell people that, you know, should they just stay away from those altogether or can they use it as additional information if they're careful with it? Do you hear those questions or stories? I, I, I do get those questions and I, I do see that. And it, quite honestly, it's one of the challenges that I face. And I, I go back to kind of our, our opening discussion when I mentioned that the business owner who who gave me the comment that this information is so valuable with my existing employees, wouldn't it be helpful to know that with a candidate before they come in? And so if if you're using the Clifton Strengths or the DISC or the Myers-Briggs and you're getting value with existing employees, that certainly is a, uh, a logical tendency to say, oh, I'd like to have this uh, about my existing people. The real challenge is that people will, when you take a DISC, for example, and I I suspect I don't know the Clifton tool as well, we we, we even advise people that think about your work situation or think about your home situation or whatever, because you adapt differently to different situations. And so if you're measuring that with a candidate who by definition is going to come into a different situation when they come into a new company, a new job, you run the risk of being misled by the results. So, so I'm, a, I'm very ardent in the, the, uh, the position that you really need to measure core behaviors in the hiring process. Yeah. Now, if you have a psychologist or psychiatrist involved in the process who can interpret results and interpret situations for you using an adaptive tool can give you some information but most of us don't want to spend the money to have a psychologist do that type of interpretation for a candidate yeah 
Yeah, makes sense. It sure does. So what other advice do you have, Phil, for our listeners? And our listeners are primarily business leaders and HR professionals. What should they know? I really go back to most organizations have really started to figure out that people are their competitive advantage. And if you believe that, then the hiring and management decisions that you're making are are really among the most important decisions that you can make in the organization. You know, we we go back and kind of use the analogy that, that a lot of organizations spend more time evaluating a copier than they do hiring an employee. With, <laughs> but, 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 but on the other hand, which has more value to the organization? Yeah. So <laughs> if most of us understand, if, if, if we've been in a management position and we're, we're making decisions based on financial data and, and other objective information, that good objective information lead to better decisions, then we really need to apply that to the hiring process. And it's becoming easier because we're talking more and more about HR analytics and big data and those kind of things. Well, the, the, the whole HR analytics, we've been doing that for, for years with assessment data, you know, building benchmarks, doing those kind of things, using data to make better decisions. I, I just want to make sure people understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. And Phil, how can people reach you if they have more questions or want to connect with you about hiring assessments? Well, they, they can go to our website, which is pdservices.com, PD for professional development, and then the word services, plural. Certainly can email me at Phil D, for Phil Devendorf, at pdservices.com. And my phone number is 740-326-4494. And I'm happy to talk with anybody who wants to discuss it. And our listeners can do any of those without having to figure out how to spell Devendorf. Exactly. Exactly. We've <laughs> taken that challenge out of that. It, it, that that uh, that's one of the reasoning ability questions. Oh, that's great. Oh, Phil, this has been it's been a pleasure, and you've taught us a lot today. And we just thank you so much for joining our podcast. I appreciate your inviting me in. And for any of our listeners who are sure members, I did want to mention that last year they launched a talent assessment center that you can get to from SHRM.org. And I think it's a nice resource to go out, take a look at all different types of assessments that are available. So just another place to go to think about. Yeah, very good. Now a word from our sponsors. Do you have a goal to be better at something in your work life, like delegating, conflict management, or aiming your signature strengths? Listening to podcasts, reading books, and attending training are great. But to really put things in context for your specific situation, the most effective method is working with a coach. Purple Inc. offers one-on-one coaching in a variety of areas, like Clifton Strengths, Human Resources, Leadership, and Career Coaching. We'd be happy to talk with you over the phone or through a video call. Visit purpleincllc.com. That's purple, I-N-K, llc.com for more information on how we can help you reach your goals. Our next guest is Melissa Boggs, the Executive Vice President of Employee Experience at Kite Realty Group. Kite Realty is a full-service, vertically integrated real estate investment trust that provides communities with convenient and beneficial shopping experiences. Mel, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So tell us why your company at Kite uses assessments. Well, we use assessments in a lot of different ways. When I came to Kite officially in 2012, I became their first head of HR. They'd never had a formalized process. And one of the charters I was given by our CEO and the board was to really create a very integrated process about how we looked at people. And I had known from my past life that assessments were a great way to help me and the management team really kind of get a roadmap for the employees that we were bringing into the organization Mm -hmm. and how they ultimately going to fit. 
And I started with the first idea of talking with managers about what is it you want to manage? Because when you, when you hire someone, that's really when the, the process starts of what you're managing. And an assessment, and there's a lot of really great assessments out there that you can use. Assessments were that roadmap to help give you some visibility into what you're going to have to manage down the line. Kind of the first thought process, it was part of my training and development initially with the leadership team. And, you know, today I, I hear when we hire someone, they will come back to me and say, what do I want to manage? And I'll say exactly what do you want to manage? And that assessments are not the end all be all. They are not the answer. They are part of the interview process. If you're using them on a pre-employment perspective, they are part of a promotional process or a development process, but they are not the end all be all. They are just simply visibility into how a person will interact with the situation, the people, et cetera. That's yeah. great. It sounds like it's a tool to help you in your decision making. It's not going to make uh, the decision for you. Absolutely. And there are many times they wanted it to be the end all be all. Sure. They, no, let's talk about why that doesn't work at the end of the day, because it, it creates a hands-off management process. They want the assessment to get, again, give them the answer. And as we all know, there are no, there is no golden answer when you're looking at people because things change, circumstances change. You're hiring a whole person. Jody, I know you know this. I mean, nine times out of 10, when we look at having to work with somebody on a performance calibration or performance correction, it's not necessarily because they technically can't do the job. Right. It's because they don't have the capability to play nice in the sandbox with everybody else. <laughs> so true. So, Melissa, what types of assessments are you currently using at Kite? Sure, sure. So, on a, on a um, and it's built over the years, okay, we, we've increased this. We actually use uh, a number of them for different reasons. So, on the pre-employment side, we use the Profiles PXT. And the reason we like that is, is that it has, it has multiple components. So it has the learning index, which is, are they capable of doing the job? Are they capable of, of taking on a lot of new information, integrating that? How are they, how's that going to look? Um, is this going to require us to have very detailed, very hands-on training? Is this person really, you know, equipped to be able to do that? So it tells us right off the bat, what kind of onboarding we're going to have to create for that person to help them be successful in the position. And then it looks at not necessarily personality, but behavioral traits. So when things don't go necessarily as they would expect, the stressors, if you will, it gives you an insight as to how they're going to look. What way are they going to go on that spectrum? And then what is their overall bend into the position that they're looking at? You know, as well as I do, many people take opportunities and they don't fully understand maybe what that position is because it's not exactly like what they had before. So this gives you an idea is what has there been? Are they very administrative? Are they very salesy? Are they very technical? Are they mechanical? And what does the role require of them in that? And how are we going to, again, align to create the greatest success for the person as well as the company? We're looking for a great, greatest ability for success. The next opportunity for us to use assessments, we also use the PXT and we've added some things to this, but we used, we used to use it for development and promotional opportunities because it did have an ability to be able to look at that. Great 360 component, which we use for executive leadership in that piece and, and creating that. Again, it really creates a better roadmap for us. And so we've evolved that because we then added the Berkman Oh, okay. High potential leadership development group. So we we went through a period from 16 to 18, 2000, oh no, I'm sorry, it was 15 to, to 17, I'm sorry. Um, and we've continued on with that, but very strongly, we put about 24 high potential candidates through. We had just come through a very large merger and we needed to have very quick visibility into how are we going to create our succession plan? How are we going to really be able to get people to step up to that next level to become not technical managers anymore, but strategic leaders? And the 
gave us a very good insight into that piece. And we also used their 360 component again on the executive level because again, we needed to develop them as well and really pointing out those blind spots that we all have as, as leaders and, and making sure that they're working on it. And then in addition to that, we added just a disk assessment and we use that for creating, we were seeing a lot of communication challenges. One of the things that one of our, our engagement surveys had told us is that we still were having trouble breaking down silos, which is a communication issue. And so the director that works in my group and I got together and we said, what's the best opportunity for us to help really focus in on the communication? How do we help people understand that just because somebody communicates this way or that way doesn't mean that they're being disrespectful or, or what have you, but how do we come together and, and do that in a way that, that is much more productive versus destructive? And we added just a straight out disk assessment. And it's been very interesting to look at We've plotted that out. We're, the, we're about 85% through the whole organization at this point. Yeah. And we're plotting that out and really seeing why we're having some of the challenges we are in certain areas because it's the way we communicate, yeah. the, way, the way we understand one another, the way we really communicate with one another. And that was in conjunction with a huge initiative that we had with a customer service initiative. The person on the outside of the building is not our only customer, we're customers to one another. So that really gave us, gave us some great visibility and gave us great gains in breaking down those silos and making us work much more efficiently. That's awesome. And it's so good to hear you're using different kinds of assessments for different things. I know so many organizations use them in the recruiting process and then they get filed away in their file and they never talk about them again. So I think that's really important. Um, it is important. And I will tell you, Jody, that we use them when, when a manager comes to me and says, you know, hey Mel, I'm having this challenge with this employee and I can't really figure it out. I said, let's go back to the assessment. So if it was the PXT, let's go back to that. Well, let's talk yeah. about what we're seeing. Well, remember we talked about this in the interview process. This is something that you knew you were going to have to manage. So talk to me about how you're managing this process. And oftentimes they'll be like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that. And so it, you know, it becomes a head scratcher and I say, okay, let's, let's look at this. So let's figure out how we're gonna develop them and work with them. And so my team will come together with that manager to provide you know, basically a full circle around this employee so that we get them back on the path to success. Because as you know, the path to being unsuccessful could be very easy to go down and, and hard to come back from. Yeah, yeah. What kind of feedback have you gotten from your employees or even applicants to? Sure. Um, you know, it's very funny. I get mixed. Some of them are very intrigued by it and they want to, to see the results themselves. So we, we do. That's one of the things we love about the, the PXT. It does give us an individual report. The individual report is not as raw as what a manager or I would see, because it, what we see is really the unvarnished truth, where the individual report that the employee or the, or the candidate would get, is we'll, and we'll go through it with them too, if it, even if we decide we're not going down that path with them because we want them to understand, we'll give them the report, they read the report. That's the other thing we like about the PXT. It's very easy to read and understand. You don't have to have a, a PhD, no offense to my PhD friends out there, but <laughs> you don't have to have a PhD to really understand it, but you can't also just take it and have nothing with it. It does require some conversation. So we will put the time and the energy into talking with people about that. And then they'll be like, oh my gosh, this is so me. I, I totally understand this. I, I get it. Yeah, that's, that's very true about me. So it's, that's what it is. But on the first part of it, it's, oh my gosh, I can't believe I had to answer all these questions and it made me think about this. And it, yeah. it, it just gets them going in a lot of different directions. Yeah, that's wonderful. So Mel, do you have any lessons learned for any of our listeners who are just starting to put their toe in the water, thinking about doing assessments, maybe some of the good or the bad, anything that you've learned that could help somebody else starting out with assessments? Sure. I think, under, first of all, understand what you're, what you're trying to get to with your assessment. What are you trying to learn from that assessment? That's number one. Making sure it's validated for the purpose that you want to use it is extremely important. Not all assessments are created equal. And for every person that you talk to, you're going to find a different assessment as the assessment of choice. Again, going back to what am I trying to learn from that assessment and how is that going to help me 
make a better hiring decision, promotional decision, development decision, et cetera, so on. I think don't let it become the answer, the end all be all. And I think if you do that, you're, you're really, you're very lopsided in your decision making, I think at that point. I think that's, that's another thing that I've learned. And I think approach it from a, a true understanding of the person who is, this person is going to be reporting to and really challenging that manager to say, what is it you want to manage? Because you're going to manage something as a manager. We don't all come out and, and not be managed. I mean, you know, Jody, you're managed by your clients, right? I mean, as the, as the president and CEO of your organization. So um, I'm managed by my CEO and the board. My CEO is managed by the board. So we all have to be managed in somehow. So you have to understand what that looks like and know, know what is success in that position. I think if you're just doing them because it's the flavor of the month or somebody, you know, comes along and says, hey, this is a great idea. We need to do this. You need to ask a lot of questions. Why? Why are we doing this? And what are we going to do with this information? And how is it going to help us get from point A to point B successfully? Wow. Very nice. Advice. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today. This has been great insight, practical insight on using assessments that will be helpful to our listeners and us. I'm glad to be here and thank you so much for asking me to join. It's, it's been great. Susan, we have a listener question today and this question comes from a listener of our podcast episode that was entitled Benefit Trends and it first aired in May 2019. How can I get employees to take an active part in understanding and managing their benefits? Wow, listener, I hear your pain because you think about the time and the energy that we as employers put into figuring out what the benefit offering is going to be and at a very high price tag. And we realize that sometimes employees, they, you know, they kind of shrug it off or it's not important to them until they need one of those benefits. And what we need to make sure we're doing is amplifying, I think, and really sounding the horn so that employees realize that we have a wonderful benefit offering at this particular organization. I want it to be what attracts other people. I want it to be what keeps you. So, you know, I was just thought it'd be nice for us to think through maybe a couple of things that if you haven't thought of doing this, let's offer them up and maybe it'd be useful, Jody. One thing I would mention is my husband works at a university and I think they are absolutely tremendous at making sure throughout the year that through their, they have a, like an HR newsletter that goes out to all of their employees. They talk about a portion of every one of those about different benefits. They just kind of shine the light on it and it kind of helps remind him that, you know what, gosh, we have yoga classes that are available or we have EAP that's available or we have whatever it is. So that kind of puts it in the forefront of employees' minds. Second thing I've seen them do, and I've heard some other, other clients do, is that they will invite whoever the dependents are, one of their staff members has, their partner, their spouse, to different types of sessions during the year to talk about benefits because they realize they offer some family benefits. Why not invite them to kind of hear and learn more about it? I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I think that is so important to include spouses. In the process, it doesn't matter if male or female, that, that many families have one person that handle the benefits. Yes. And, and many times that's not the employee. I've come to, to appreciate too that we don't always, or mostly we don't appreciate our benefits until we use them. Mm -hmm. For example, you mentioned an EAP. Well, you might have been had access to an EAP for 20 years yeah. and never called it. And then until you call it and, mm -hmm. and reap some personal benefit or, or get some good insight from that, you don't appreciate that that is something that is a positive thing for people. And even the same on, you know, health insurance, unless mm -hmm. you've, you've had maybe a more significant health experience, you don't always appreciate the value of, of the benefit of that, that, you know, you had a surgery that cost $50,000 and you didn't have to pay anything for it, or your deductible was $1,000 or $5,000. So it really, really is difficult to get that through. I, I had met even 
for me personally, even though I'd been in HR for many years until I was actually responsible for the benefits of my organization starting in 2003, I realized how I didn't even always understand benefits. And I, for many years, had been on my husband's benefit plan. And so I just kind of took those for granted. But it's a difficult thing to help your employees be active and understanding and managing and and taking part and utilizing, you know, utilizing that free yoga class. (laughs) It's not on their radar until they really need it. A couple of other things that I have seen companies do, they'll, in addition to everything being online, which is really a beautiful thing for a lot of reasons, they will also send like postcards or they'll send different things through snail mail, just in case the person, as you said, who's really the benefit decision maker, isn't, may not be the employee. It gives, it kind of says, hey, open enrollment is going to be October 11th through November 7th. Let's put it on the family calendar. I think that's not a bad idea. I agree. I agree. And then, of course, many companies will, at least once a year, send out a statement of, here's what your compensation is, and then they make a real effort to show, and here's all the other benefits we pay on your behalf. So your true salary, you know, may not be 48000 It really is 60000 the way we view it. I think that's just another maybe tip to try to amplify how important benefits are and maybe get employees engaged more. Right. Right. Good luck to you, listener. Yes, I love it. It's time for In the News, an article on hrdive.com that was published February 28th, 2020, highlighted companies who have come together since 2018 midterm elections, actually the midterm elections, on a nonpartisan initiative that's called Time to Vote. As of this date, which today happens to be the middle of April 2020, 383 employers have joined the coalition to provide ways to encourage their employees to vote on election days with a special eye on the November 2020 presidential election. These first 383 companies have had more than, altogether have more than 2 million workers. So this type of encouragement that they're doing includes ensuring their employees know that they've got time off to vote with or without pay, and not, but just not counting it as an absence. They are also offering resources that support early voting and the use of mail-in ballots, why that can be important depending where you live, et cetera. So some of these employers that are part of that 383 company forum so far include Best Buy, Walmart, HP, Target, J.P. Morgan Chase, and others. So if your organization wants to join this campaign, just go to maketimetovote.org to learn more. Thanks for listening today and make it a joy-powered day. If you would like SHRM recertification credit for listening to this podcast, please visit getjoypowered.com slash SHRM. You'll find an evaluation of the podcast, and once you complete the evaluation, you will see the SHRM recertification credit code and a link to a proof of participation certificate. Again, that's getjoypowered.com slash SHRM. Thank you for listening, and thanks for your dedication to the HR profession. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Joy Powered Workspace podcast. If you like the show, please tell your friends about it, and let us know what you think of our podcast by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. It helps new people find our show. The Joy Powered Workspace podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can learn more about Joy Powered and find our books and blogs at getjoypowered.com. We're at Joy Powered on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Sign up for our monthly email newsletter at getjoypowered.com slash newsletter. If you have comments, suggestions, or questions about anything related to business or HR, you can leave us a voicemail at 317 688 1613 or email us at joypowered at gmail.com. We hope you tune in next time. Make it a joy-powered day.